I'm Susan Cox and today I'd like to talk about how we can make the best use of the information available in localization microscopy. Since there are hundreds of papers being published every year using this technique, I think it's an important topic. We want the results obtained with this technique to be accurate and reliable and not turn out in five years time to have been hallucinations of the method. In case you haven't heard of localization microscopy, let's start out with a brief history. Light microscopy has always been a popular technique, particularly with the advent of fluorescence microscopy, which allowed you to image the distribution of specific proteins and molecules within your sample. However, while light microscopy images can look very sharp, there's a hard limit to their resolution. Since light is a wave as well as a particle, it is subject to a diffraction limit which limits the resolution to about half the wavelength of the light used, which in practice means about 200 to 300 nanometers. So an image of the cell could look quite sharp, but if you zoomed in, you would see that at a certain scale we lose information, not just due to the size of the camera pixels, but because of the limitations of the imaging process itself. In the 1990s and 2000s, people discovered a number of ways to circumvent the diffraction limit with the best known being stimulated emission depletion microscopy, structured illumination microscopy, and localization microscopy. By localization microscopy, I mean a smorgasbord of techniques that bear witness to our field's sad addiction to acronyms, PALM, STORM, GSD, and many others. They all achieve super resolution by the same basic mechanism, which is to exploit the fact that you can find the position of a known shape much more accurately than the size of that shape. For example, if I wanted to find the precise location of St. Paul's, I could fit the position with what I know of the shape. If I then wanted to know the exact position of the centre of St. Paul's, I could find it much more accurately than the size of the building. If you have a single molecule emitting light, this will be imaged as a blob shape, which we call the point spread function of the microscope. This is an airy disk, though we often just approximate the shape as a Gaussian function. We can fit the position of the molecule very accurately because we know the shape that we expect it to make. But most samples don't consist of single, well-separated molecules. The samples are interesting because of their structure. This means you can't localise the positions of the point spread functions because they're all overlapping, and you can't tell where one ends and another begins. Localization microscopy solves this problem by changing the behaviour of the fluorophores so you have only a few emitting in each frame, a process called blinking. This means you have to take many, many images, in each of which only a few fluorophores are emitting light. You then fit the positions of the molecules and reconstruct an image of your sample by plotting the position of every molecule. This gives you the big advantage that you've improved the resolution, with the disadvantage that your data set took you a really, really long time to acquire. So, problem solved! We can just go get a coffee while we acquire our data, submit to Nature Journals and party, right? Well, not quite. I've assumed that exciting a few fluorophores is always going to be possible and will always result in well-separated fluorophores that are easy to fit. There are a few problems with that assumption. First, the excitation of the fluorophores is stochastic. That is, you can't control which fluorophores get excited, just what proportion of them do. So, however low the density that you excite is, at some point you're going to be unlucky and excite two fluorophores close together. Oh no! If you do a straightforward fit of the overlapping fluorophores, then you'll end up finding the position of the fluorophore between the two real-life positions, which is bad. Second, you may have a limited control over the activation density. When using the most popular type of localization microscopy, D-Storm, you control the blinking of the fluorophore using a buffer and a high power laser to drive fluorophores into the non-emitting state. But with very densely labelled samples, particularly those with a lot of 3D structure, it can be challenging to get images in which no fluorophores overlap, because we don't have infinite laser power available. And if you want a second colour apart from the 647 channel, or hail Alexa 647, it's even more challenging. Third, there are some types of sample where you can't take several minutes to collect a single image. In light cell imaging, for example, structures in the cell often move and change over a period of minutes or even seconds. We want to image dynamics, 
we have to collect the data faster. The easiest way to do that is to collect the data with a higher activation density, like this. Or even this. As you'll notice, this data has a lot of overlap. Unsurprisingly, a lot of people decided it would be a very good idea to be able to use this sort of data. Including me. There have been a lot of papers published on it. What these methods all have in common is they try to achieve a result better than single emitter fitting by building more information into the model. A simple fit just has information about a single point spoke function shape, but we can include, for example, how many fluorophores we think are in an overlapping patch if we know something about the number of photons a fluorophore is likely to emit. Or we can use the fact that fluorophores blink on and off, that is, use information from the time domain. However, what I became interested in is that all of these methods, including simple single molecule fitting, run into a fundamental problem. If you get an activation density that is too high for the algorithm, you get artifacts. That means that the image doesn't represent the underlying sample. Structures like clusters and small rings are drawn into the center, linear structures become narrower and smoother, and random distributions appear as clusters. These effects, as a whole, I'm going to call artificial sharpening. If you're using a standard method that fits single molecules, these errors start to come in for molecules separated by about 400 nanometers. You're not even safe at the diffraction limit. There are some things that you can watch out for. Structures that look very smooth and sharp clusters are often warning signs that artificial sharpening may be happening. If you're using a method based on deep learning, seeing results that align with the top or bottom of the image would be a warning that the algorithm is responding to a feature of the image that wasn't fully simulated. Though, of course, that's not the only artifact that can occur with deep learning. Those waters are deep and shark infested, enter at your own risk. But what you'd ideally like is to know that your data doesn't contain artifacts, rather than just go on your gut instinct. Now, there are ways that you can test the performance of your localization microscopy system, that is, your microscope and analysis algorithm, and that can give you some idea of the likely performance. You can use test structures like DNA origami and test that the image that you get corresponds to the shape that you'd expect. For the algorithm, you could check how it performs in something like the localization microscopy challenge. But there are limitations to both of these. The main issue is that the degree of overlap between point spread functions will depend very strongly on the structure of the sample. So, for example, if you have small, well-separated clusters, linear structures, or extended 2D structures, then the activation density that gives artifact-free results will decrease by about an order of magnitude as you move from one type of structure to another. So if you're looking at DNA origami, or a biological test structure like the nuclear core complex, then you might get good results. But if you use the same experimental parameters to image a different structure, then the level of overlap in the data could be very different, and it's possible you might get artifacts even if you had completely clean test data. How do we solve this problem? We need a way of assessing data that can be used on any data set. The basic idea that any method that achieves this is going to have to follow is to take your analysed data and compare it to something. So what can you compare it to? Fourier ring correlation, which is a popular method originally applied in electron microscopy, compares the data to itself. You split the localised positions randomly into two halves, Fourier transform both of them, and then compare how correlated the two results are at different length scales. Having a method that works on real experimental data sets was a huge leap forward for the field and was very important in illustrating how different factors like localization precision and labeling density affect the resolution. The problem with this approach is that what it measures is the sharpness of the image. It can't test how well the localizations reflect the underlying structure of the sample because it's just comparing the structure to itself. So if you get artificial sharpening, that will be reported as higher resolution. Normally at this point, I illustrate this effect by showing how the reported resolution gets better as the activation density gets higher when you use FRC, even when you know it should be getting worse because you know the ground truth. And I try and make it relatable by saying it's like FRC is a bad friend who you go out drinking with, 
and then you know you should go home, but FRC says it's getting better and better and the knife is fantastic and it keeps trying to persuade you to go to a nightclub, but I kind of feel under current circumstances that isn't relatable anymore. Maybe you could imagine FRC is messaging you as you sit at home alone and trying to persuade you to eat more biscuits, I don't know. Alternatively, instead of comparing the localization microscopy data to itself, you can compare it to something else. That's the approach taken by Squirrel, which takes a localization image and a wide field image and asks how similar they are. This method is really good at spotting missing structural and nonlinearities in the data. It's important though when looking at the error maps to understand that they're looking at differences in correlation. You could have the same structure present in the localization and wide field images, but if the imaging is nonlinear, and it often is because you're more likely to pick up background localizations than ones from the structure, then it will show up when you map the errors. The other disadvantage is that because you're comparing to the wide field, this is only useful for imaging errors down to the resolution of the wide field image. Of course, it's very useful to know if there are errors at this length scale, but it would also be very helpful to know if there are errors at smaller length scales. So what we really want is a way to compare the localization microscopy data to equivalent data that we know isn't biased or artificially sharpened, and this will tell us if the original data contains any artifacts. We just happen to have developed such a method. What a remarkable coincidence. So we developed a method called HAWK, which stands for Haar Wavelet Kernel Analysis. What HAWK does is it carries out a series of filters in time. The filters look like this. What do these filters do? Let's consider the case where we have a couple of fluorophores which are close together and blinking to illustrate. The first level filter will show fluorophores that are turning on or turning off. You can see the fluorophore appearing in the first level filter as the fluorophore comes on and turns off. The second level filter will show fluorophores which are on for two frames. You can see the fluorophore appearing in this filter when it's been on for two frames in the original data. The third level filter will show fluorophores which are on for four frames. There we are. Our simulations of how Hawk would perform on high density data indicated that this approach seemed to get rid of the effects that changed the apparent structure of the sample. Since Hawk is just a pre-processing step, it has to be used in conjunction with a fitting method. Here we just use it with Thunderstorm which is a standard fitting method that has both single and multi-emitter fitting options. As you can see, using other analysis methods, the two lines tend to collapse into one another or exhibit a lot of structure in the space between the lines that doesn't actually exist. I'd emphasize the methods we've chosen here are a sample. In our tests, we found these effects happen with all the methods we've tested, though as the quality of fit improves, methods can return accurate results at higher activation density. It's also important to note that all these methods can give accurate results if they're used at an appropriate density. There's just no way to measure if the density is, in fact, appropriate. These results seemed really encouraging. So obviously, as physicists, our next thought was, hey, pairs of straight lines seem to be a really good way to see when methods might give you artifacts. I wonder if there are any biological structures that are pairs of straight line. And there are. We looked at proteins in muscle fibers here, the protein T12, which we imaged at both high density and after bleaching low density. The results from the experimental data are really similar to the results from the simulations, which was reassuring. And we knew the result we got with Hawk was correct because it matched both the low density measurements and the expected spacing from electron microscopy. Now, back when we were discussing the motivations for this work, I gave three main reasons for why you would have to deal with overlapping fluorophores. Randomness is going to be present in pretty much all experiments, but we thought we should be able to do experiments for conditions that people were likely to encounter because of two or three. The classic issue when activation control may be limited is two color experiments. We took two color data of platinum coated pits and tubulin, and you can see marked improvements between our results using a standard algorithm and our results using Hawk. How about live cell imaging? This presented a major challenge because generally in live cell imaging, you're operating under challenging conditions, trying to collect your data as fast as possible. And that whole time your sample is moving. So if you want to collect a different type of data, then the sample may have changed when you're collecting the first data set. It's almost enough to make you question why you're doing live cell super resolution.
Anyway, we realise that if you use a photo switchable fluorophore like MEOS, which you switch from emitting light of one wavelength into emitting light of another wavelength, then you can actually excite and collect both channels. That gives you high and low density localization data for the same region of the sample at roughly the same time. Using this approach, we were able to collect data of polysomes and focal adhesions in live cells at both high and low activation densities. As you can see, the column on the left, which is low density data, shows the same structure as the column on the right, which is the Hawk data. For focal adhesions, we weren't able to get a very high reconstruction density from the low density data, because there's a limit to the amount of time you can hit a cell with a 405 nanometer laser and describe the results as representative or even live cell. Even so, you can see when you compare to the results other methods get, the lack of artificial sharpening and the good reproduction of the structure. Why does Hawk do this? Well, we didn't really tackle this in the paper, besides saying that Hawk separates the fluorophores over more frames and so makes fitting easier. Having thought about it a lot over the last couple of years, I think the key element of Hawk is that it removes the background so you're only fitting fluorophores which are switching. Multi-emitter fitting methods will work well if the density is low enough, but they won't warn you when the density is too high. And if there are lots of fluorophores that are on at the same time, almost all these methods will fit fairly evenly spaced fluorophores in the bright blob. For line type structures, that's what leads to artificial sharpening. The fluorophores overlap, so they're placed in the centre of the line with very low scatter, but the positions along the line are essentially random. We were really pleased with the results of Hawk, and of course the next logical step was to try to use the fact that Hawk doesn't give you artefacts to allow assessment of results from any algorithm, because for some reason not everyone immediately wanted to give up their favourite algorithm to use Hawk. Though sometimes the reason that people don't like using Hawk is that the results don't look so sharp. And I hate to be a party pooper, but if you're getting beautifully sharp results using your favourite algorithm and nothing with Hawk, it's because the algorithm you're using is effectively doing a deconvolution and there's no localization going on. If you really like sharp images, then just do a high pass filter on your wide field image and keep it in a hidden folder on your computer as a shameful secret. It's okay, we've all done it. So anyway, we did find a way to use Hawk to test for artificial sharpening. We call this method Hawkman, which stands for Hawk Method of Assessment of Nanoscopy. When using Hawkman, the sequence goes you take your data, analyze first using your method of choice, and second by pre-processing using Hawk and then analyzing that data. We generally recommend using a standard fitting method like Thunderstorm. But if you want to try testing another method with and without Hawk, it should still highlight artificial sharpening. We then blur the images and flatten the intensity profile. This helps as there are often a small number of fluorophores that appear many times and are therefore disproportionately bright. We then carry out two types of thresholding. In the first, we perform a local threshold, which is fairly permissive. We call this the sharpening map. In the second, we set the threshold to a higher level and then skeletonize the image. We call this the structure map. We correlate these images and then use the level of correlation to assign a confidence level to the data in the original image, the one processed without Hawk. We tested Hawkman on data from the localization microscopy challenge of microtubules where it was able to identify areas that didn't have an accurate structure. Here I fitted the data with two different algorithms, a single emitter and a multi-emitter fit. Below the images, I show the sharpening map, structure map and confidence map for a particular length scale. As you can see, for the single emitter fitting data, the sharpening map identifies many areas of sharpening in magenta. These are much less apparent in the multi-emitter fit, as we would expect. We also looked at high-density data from multiple different biological structures, including clathrin-coated pits, microtubules, and mitochondria. Hawkman is able to identify missing structure, which appears as cyan in the sharpening map, and false structure, which appears as magenta. The confidence map shows areas where the data is problematic in red. This work is currently under review, and we hope to be able to release the tool soon. So what's my conclusion from all this? What should you actually do if you're somebody who takes localization microscopy data? 
Am I saying that we should live in fear all the time? Well, kind of. I think it's important to move past what images look like and really try to dig in to whether an image is a real reflection of your sample. That isn't just the responsibility of people who develop the technique, it's something that everyone is going to have to do. If you use a localization microscopy technique, you need to be testing to see if things are going wrong. On the plus side, I think we are now at a point as a field when we can really start to allow people to assess data in a meaningful way, to make scientific discoveries that are reproducible. And after all, that's what science is all about. I'd like to thank everyone involved in this work, particularly Richard Marsh, who led the Hawk and Hawkman project, and Ishan Costello, who carried out a lot of the experimental work. This all wouldn't be possible without the whole group, my collaborators, and my funders, so a big thank you to them, and to you, for listening.